This podcast is for educational purposes and not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment for yourself or for others, including patients that you are treating if you are a practitioner. Please consult your own physician for any medical or psychiatric issues that you may be having. Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In the last newsletter, I talked about copper overload, what causes it, and what symptoms and situations copper overload is often at play. In today's episode, I'll comment on testing, but spend more time on treatment considerations. So to start it off, I'd like to read a comment that was made on a blog post I wrote in 2015 titled, Copper Overload, Too Much of a Good Thing. And the comment was, I am a primary care physician in Dublin, and I attended the Walsh course in Sydney in 2006. I learned a great deal there, and I used his work almost every day. High copper in women is very common in Ireland, and it is quite easy to bring it down after the first month of treatment. I have been to courses all over the world from Harvard to Cambridge, but the course in Australia, which again was the Walsh course, was the most useful of them all. Each week I utterly changed the life of some people, and it is a real privilege to have that opportunity. Unquote. So he explains well what many of us who have been trained through the Walsh Research Institute feel. So regarding testing, if copper overload is so prevalent, why isn't it being identified and treated in conventional or allopathic medicine? If high copper were treated with pharmaceuticals and not nutrients, it likely would be taught in medical schools and continuing education conferences. As it stands, physicians rarely check copper levels unless they're looking for the rare and most extreme form of copper toxicity, which is called Wilson's disease, and this is not what I'm focusing on here. If physicians did check levels, many cases of copper overload would still be missed. The Pfeiffer-Walsh normal range that we use is narrower than the range provided by most labs. Aside from looking at serum copper, We also measure ceruloplasmin. This is a protein that binds copper. With both levels, we calculate the percentage of free, unbound copper. It is this free copper that can be causing problems. Someone can have a normal copper level used by a standard lab or even the Walsh Pfeiffer range and still have high free copper. We also look at the ratio between copper and zinc. So this gives us multiple values to consider and inform us. Not the least, we are looking closely at someone's symptoms and their history. The labs are not considered in isolation. So I'd like to go through 10 points regarding treatment. The first is to lower exposure. Though exposure alone isn't usually the biggest driver, it is important to assure that more copper is not coming in when it is already at a high level. Copper sources could be a copper IUD or copper-containing supplements. Chocolate, carob, and shellfish are especially high in copper. There are other foods such as avocado, organ meat, lamb, nuts, beans that also have a fair amount but don't tend to be as high as copper and shellfish. Because copper is not a heavy metal, It is in the water source and not removed by typical water filters. The Berkey and the Zero water pitcher are just two examples of water filtration that remove copper. Well water is especially high in copper, and algae treatments used for swimming pools also have copper, and this would be relevant to someone mainly if they're a regular swimmer. Similarly, handling copper, for example, in jewelry making, would be a less common, though, real source. Number two, optimize zinc. Zinc is needed to increase the expression of metallothionines. 
These are lesser known, though incredible proteins, which regulate copper, among other things. The amount of zinc we recommend depends on someone's plasma zinc level. As with the other nutrients that I'll mention, dosing also depends on someone's age, their weight, how well they absorb nutrients, and their overall clinical picture. Too much zinc, too quickly, can rapidly mobilize copper and cause worsening of symptoms. Excess zinc can cause anemia. Number three, augmenting nutrients. These include vitamin C, E, A, and selenium. These are antioxidants. It is expected that anyone with brain-related symptoms is dealing with a degree of oxidative stress, including and perhaps especially those with copper overload. B6 is also part of a nutrient protocol for high copper. I usually use the active form of B6 called P5P, or pyridoxal phosphate, as it is generally better tolerated. Number four, adequate protein. Ciriloplasmin, as mentioned, is a protein that binds copper. If we are low in protein, ciriloplasmin could be low and result in a higher percentage of free copper. Again, the copper that's stirring up trouble. Number five, consider molybdenum when needed. When a copper level is especially high in an adult, I will use this trace mineral at relatively conservative doses. This can powerfully lower copper and without lab monitoring could lead to a copper deficiency. It's not something we usually use in children. Number six, address other nutrient imbalances. It is rare for someone to have one brain-related nutrient imbalance. More often, we are treating a pyrrole disorder or a methylation imbalance. This could be under or over methylation. Remember that high pyrroles can cause low zinc, which causes high copper. This is another reason beyond variations of age, weight, and absorption that the nutrient protocols are not the same for everyone. Number seven, address other sources of oxidative stress. Now, this is something that I talked about in the previous newsletter, but if someone has a form of toxicity, microbial overgrowth, or for whatever reason they're having a severe stress response, these should be addressed for their own sake, but also to help address secondary issues such as high copper. When I included my personal experience with copper overload in my blog post, Too Much of a Good Thing, I didn't know I also had mold toxicity a likely contributor to my high copper. Number eight, address added estrogen. Whether it's birth control or hormone replacement, it's important to provide education so that the patient and their prescribing doctor, usually a gynecologist, can better weigh the risk and benefits of adding estrogen. This can be tricky. For example, a sexually active teen might be highly impulsive and found to have high copper, likely driving much of that impulsivity. Her copper level could very likely be increased by the birth control pills. While in some cases it may be possible to normalize copper while someone is on added estrogen, in my experience, it is more often not possible. Number nine, further support metallothionines if needed. Generally, the nutrient protocol is working in the direction of supporting those metallothionines that are at the blood-brain barrier and the gut-blood barrier. For those situations in which copper is not coming down as expected, a targeted treatment called metallothionine promotion therapy developed by Dr. William Walsh is available. We also use this in autism, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease, and it's showing promise in other conditions as well. Number 10, and not the least, is monitor. I generally will have someone work up their full doses of nutrients over three to four weeks to avoid moving copper too quickly. The nutrients can be compounded into fewer pills or a liquid suspension, which would be akin to a customized multivitamin, or the nutrients can be taken separately. Copper, zinc, and ceruloplasmin testing is generally repeated 
at three to six months, then six months later, and then once a year for those who are remaining on the protocol. Normalizing copper can take two to three months, but clear improvement can start as early as three to four weeks. What I am especially interested in and mindful of is that many people with elevated copper have mold toxicity and or other biotoxins. And so if those issues are addressed, it may be that someone doesn't need the same level of zinc, doesn't have the same need for chronic treatment for copper overload. Though by monitoring, this becomes evident over time. And for the most part, if someone's getting monitoring and they're getting this antioxidant support and their zinc is getting optimized, it would, it would only be helping them in many ways as far as their overall health as well as their mental health. While nutrients in the supplemental form can be very helpful, they can cause harm if not used correctly and without a broader sense of their impact on other body systems. As I write these newsletters or give these podcasts, my goal is not to provide a recipe for self-treatment, but to help people find their answers and to hopefully raise awareness, however small, in the allopathic or conventional medical community, but also in the functional medicine community. By reading about the imbalances on the Walsh Research Institute website, on my website, or in Dr. Walsh's book aptly titled Nutrient Power, most people can get a pretty good idea of which imbalances they may be dealing with. For those interested, the Walsh Research Institute has a resource map to find trained practitioners. The role of copper in brain conditions is just one of the discoveries of Dr. Walsh. To give you more of a sense of my deep appreciation of him as a pioneer and as a humble and wise human being, I'll share a quote from my post blog post, Lunch with Dr. William Walsh, His Story, Discoveries, and the Future of Nutrient-Based Psychiatry. So what do you do when you have answers that could impact one of the biggest health crises in the modern world? If you're Dr. Walsh, you consider the words of Gandhi. When the people lead, the leaders will follow. He started the Walsh Research Institute with one goal being to train 1,000 physicians around the world in his advanced nutrient protocols. He explained his thinking to me. If he trains 1,000 doctors and they each treat 2,000 people, then 2 million people could potentially benefit and go on to share their experience. Eventually, the leaders will follow. Dr. Walsh continues to surpass this goal. There are over 1,000 physicians and medical practitioners who have attended at least one Walsh Research Institute workshop. The next newsletter will be bringing attention back to the right brain. And for those who are paid subscribers, look out this week for a newsletter where I'll share more about your new best friend, metallothionines, and the relationship between high copper and cancer. Until next time, or until we connect on Substack, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, I look forward to connecting with you. Take care. Bye-bye.